Uh, so I'm James Kumar, and I work for DDN. In fact, I'm the uh, pre-sales manager for EMEA. Um, can I ask the audience, I like to do these polls, uh, who's heard of DDN before? So there are some that haven't, right? There's still some that haven't. Um, so that's good, because I've tried to keep this uh, presentation. Uh, so we've got some technical depth, but there's also, I'm trying not to lose anybody as we go through. So I made these slides this morning. Um, the boat trip was really nice. Uh, I went out for a run this morning. It was a very nice blue sky, just blue everywhere. And I realized I live in England. <laughs> I've actually seen this much blue since my wife, wife's uh, computer crashed last week. <laughs> so I chose the big data topic. And there were several kind of themes to this conference. And I thought big data was the one I was going to go for. So to summarize DDN's products, we kind of um, have a tradition in HPC, very high-end HPC. And we've got some storage systems we've been um, building for about 12 years. And the latest generation you can see here, basically in the middle of this picture. So of course, we use SAS, SATA, SSDs inside these boxes. We've got some fairly recent technology additions, which is FSX, SFX stuff you see here. And this is about more intelligent cache management. We have the main sort of platforms, the hardware platforms themselves, which are basically these red boxes you see in the middle. Then on top of that, we apply all sorts of different solutions to kind of help us attack various different sorts of big data problems. So the ones you see here are the kind of the traditional ones for DDN. So it's a grid scaler is a GPFS system, so a parallel file system for supercomputers. Exascalar is a similar thing, but based on Lustre. Um, we do analytics, and we do other sorts of file systems. In fact, more recently, we've been experimenting using the same underlying hardware platforms, but um, seeing how they work with other types of big data problem. And we really see big data as applying not just in analytics. So some people would say, yeah, big data, that's like Hadoop. But really, just take a different opinion. Um, we say big data is all the data lifecycle, where you have the three Vs, this high volume, high variance, or high velocity, or some combination of these two challenging things about big data. So if there's lots of it, if it's, you need it to go really fast from one place to another place, or if the data types are very, very uh, varied, then these can be all be big data problems. So it's not just analytics. We could be big data in ingest, in compute, in archive, in storage, and um, distribution. So I'm going to talk about a, few, a bunch of these things as they apply to big data. Um, so who has heard of, let's go, SAS Analytics. This is a commercial uh, analytical sort of, um, sort of very limited scalability, like eight nodes or grid. IRODS, anybody know who, what IRODS is? Come on, one, must be one. Okay, I'll talk about iRODS later. iRODS is an open source middleware product that allows you, it's, an open, um, it's developed at Rensi, and it allows you to really span the globe with, this, um, with your pseudo file system. So you can have a single file handle, and you can put your files may reside across multiple locations around the globe. And when you install iRODS on all these systems, you can treat um, a file which may be in multiple replicas in multiple countries with one handle. So it, makes, it really simplifies the management and policy management of very large-scale data. KX, again, before I um, joined DDN, I didn't know KX. This is a strange kind of NoSQL database that is used in the finance space. So I'll tell you a bit about that. Vertica is made by HP. This is a columnar database. And then Hadoop at the end, of course, we're probably familiar. Who's familiar with the Hadoop? Let's see some hands. Let's see if your hands actually work. Who's familiar with the Hadoop? OK, we've got some, we've got some hands there. So to get it really simple, um, I've drawn my own pictures for you. So we're departing now from DDN marketing pictures, and we've got my own. And I'm going to just give you my sort of view of the different sort of solutions you can push to try and solve the challenges of various big data problems. What you see there is a compute cluster. So what we're all talking about mainly today in this room. So a high-performance computing supercomputer, the computes, the square things. And it's all hammering some kind of large file system. So that's sort of shape one, and we're pretty familiar with that. A similar kind of related shape is this one. The data is still separated from the compute. 
uh, they're still in separate boxes. But in this case, rather than having to deal with 100 clients hammering the storage, or 1,000 clients hammering the storage, or more, we might have a very limited number, maybe just one, or it might be four, or eight. And this is important because it's a different, it's a different problem for a storage company to solve. One is, so the one above there is trying to resolve parallelism and concurrency. Many, many parallel, millions of parallel threads hammering the storage system. The low one, we have to try and deliver as much throughput and IOPS to a single client, and this is a very different problem. Data inside the compute starts getting a bit strange now, and this is what Hadoop is like. Um, so with Hadoop, we have all these compute nodes. We stick some disk inside them tra traditionally, and then we move the compute to where the data resides. So the data is in sitting inside the computers themselves. So I'm stop carrying this around. Even stranger, uh, how about putting compute inside the data? So what does that mean? Uh, this means we take what are normally external compute processes running on external servers, we run them inside a storage controller. And then finally, so I come across this a lot. So we work a lot with, in academia, doing big supercomputers, that's our tradition. But more and more, we're dealing with this kind of problem. They've got data and compute just spread all over an organization in a very complex way. Nobody really knows where it is. Um, they're trying to do compute and analytics, let's say. They're trying to get um, value out of all this data. So in a university environment, this is quite typical, right? We often have many uh, researchers working on their own research, producing really good information. Um, but is it accessible remotely? Um, can you gather that information up into one metadata set and query it all? Uh, usually not. So these are the kind of five solution shapes that I could come up with to address big data challenges. Um, the final challenge is, denoted by my large pink oval, uh, is how do we combine all these different sorts of file spaces into one sort of coherent system? So we know we're gonna need different things for different problems, but how might we go about trying to present that to our administrators and users and data systems, applications, etc., as a single coherent uh, resource? So I'm going to go into a bit, depth, bit, bit more depth on each of those topics. Talk about how DDN kind of treats each one of these systems. This should become quite clear. And I've got loads of time, I think, because I've got an extra hour. Is that right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Um, so data separate from compute. This is our traditional supercomputing systems. And uh, DDN has a very strong heritage in, in large supercomputers. And we use these SFA systems. Um, so for those, the half of the audience who weren't really familiar with DDN, um, these FA, SFA systems are um, comprised of these controllers, the red things, and then a number of disk enclosures. Um, the important thing to differentiate us from most other uh, storage vendors is it's quite a large building block approach. So each one of these controller pairs will push upwards of 30 gigabytes a second of real file system performance through to your cluster. And each one of the enclosures can hold uh, up to 84 drives. And each controller pair can handle 20 enclosures. So that means this build, big building block approach means that you can wheel in uh, two racks. There's only two controllers in a pair, redundant pair, but they could be up to 6.7 petabytes uh, managed by those two controllers. So it's kind of a different approach, and the reason that makes us popular with the large supercomputer vendors is if they say, give us 20 petabytes, our solution looks quite modest. It's like, well, it's four controllers, and then a few racks of enclosures, it's quite simple. The simplicity at scale is one of the kind of core uh, tenets at DDN. So inside those controllers, and I'll mention this now, we actually build these on Intel motherboards. They're Sandy Bridge dual socket motherboards inside these controllers, so it's a very, very beefy controller, and that's why we get this sort of huge performance, or one of the reasons we do. Um, now, we don't rely upon Linux to manage all this stuff and run Linux RAID, of course. We've developed over the past five years about a million lines of code. In fact, I think it's probably two million um, lines of code, which runs in a state machine, so independent of the Linux kernel. We do our own drivers, Backward, both pointing downwards to the disk and pointing upwards to the network um, to manage uh, a very scalable standard block delivery platform. We've got all kinds of features in there we developed to, to uh, 
make us a good choice at this very large scale, very intense high performance computer environments. So that's the SFA, and that's the 12K system here. <coughs> but as I mentioned, we've always been, also been experimenting about how this same platform, which we've traditionally shifted into big supercomputer sites, works in the more commercial areas, where they tend to use smaller systems and maybe have um, different sorts of data, and they're trying to use SQL-like queries. So they're not really used to running a big MPI job across a parallel supercomputer, but if you give them a database and some SQL interface, then they can do something. Um, and whilst it's not the same scale in terms of volumes and capacities and throughputs, the challenges are still there, because now we need, quite often, to get these very high IOPS rates the very high IOPS and very high throughputs through to really small numbers of machines. And this is equally challenging. So I'll take one of these examples. So I think we're really we're leading in all these, these sets. So Vertica is a columnar database. It's a database, but we've, we've, we hold all the stuff on disk in a columnar fashion, which means when it's read through cache, it's, it's, it's read through in a columnar way. And that's good for analytics, because you're normally doing a sums on columns, not in rows. So it's just a different design of the underlying database. SAS, they do this kind of, allows you to do kind of SQL-like queries across a small grid of computers which attack a storage system um, where you hold uh, some SAS data, which might be things like, so utility companies might do it to analyze customer, um, customer billing data, or a bank might use it to, uh, again, analyze how their customers react when certain market, condi market conditions take place. Uh, KX is an interesting one we've done recently. So we've just uh, uh, won, uh, if we can use the word won, uh, the stack M3 test. I, we got the best results. Um, and in that case, it's the opposite of the supercomputer. We just got a big, fat, in fact, IBM, but it could be Dell, uh, um, four socket, two terabyte uh, SMP system. We attach it via four InfiniBand links into this big storage system, the SFA, and then the behavior of this KX database is to read in huge streaming reads of multiple terabytes into memory, uh, hassle it a lot, and then throw it away and read some more in. And to give you an idea of what it's doing, what it's doing is the algorithmic traders on the, on the floor, they're trying to you know, make their bank money by coming up with clever algorithms that are going to automatically go on the, on the stock market and make, make some money doing clever deals. What they don't want to happen is to lose lots of money. That's a bad thing. Um, so they've got to do this risk analysis. And the approach they take is to download all the stock market data, so five or ten years of tick data off the stock market, stick it in the storage system, then they backtest. So they take their existing, their new algorithms they're very excited about, they run it across this historical data, and they say, well, in the past ten years, this algorithm would have made us money. So the chances are, if we put it on the stock market tomorrow, we're going to be good. So they can analyze their risk. So data inside the compute. This is my Hadoop um, example. So in fact, uh, normally with a Hadoop, you do exactly that. You buy some clusters. You normally put some extra disks inside them. And then you run HDFS to sort of combine these storage systems into one uh, magic storage system, um, albeit with no, a number of replicas of each individual uh, piece of data. And then you run the compute across that system, across all the compute nodes, where the data is then local. Um, we actually launched this different approach, uh, which we kind of appliancify the whole Hadoop environment uh, using this SFA technology. So in fact, we kind of replace the data inside the compute using the wonder of RDMA and InfiniBand to help get very fast, low latency uh, data from clients, which are very close to massive storage arrays, which can deliver the IOPS. This fourth example, the compute inside the data one, I mentioned this is a bit strange. This is where we take what is normally external compute threads running on clusters or servers, and we virtualize them, and we execute them inside our storage, process, our storage engine itself. So our RAID controller, of which there's usually a pair for redundancy, as I said, it's kind of a Sandy Bridge motherboard, therefore it's x86. And uh, historically, what we've always done is give you GPFS or Lustre file systems by having our block system. We attach it by InfiniBand to a number of external servers, and we then export a Lustre file system from there to a huge compute system. Now, that's um, 
it's very scalable. I mean, there's nothing to compare the performance and scalability of parallel file systems, as we know. Nothing else really quite matches it in terms of sheer scalability. The issue is it can look a bit complex with its multiple layers. And when we're talking to an enterprise customer, like a bank or a, an aerospace company, sometimes they go, well, there's lots of wires, there's lots of servers, lots of power. This looks quite complex. But what we can do with this embedded system is take what are normally external servers exporting the file system, virtualize them, then place them on one of the processors inside our storage array and export the file systems directly from the storage array itself. So this is a picture of the Sandy Bridge motherboard, it's a block diagram, so there's one processor, two processors. This processor is talking through the IO bridge to backend disks, and this process here is talking out to the network. And on this processor, we run these, file system, these virtualized file system servers. And therefore, when we wheel the system in front of a customer, what they see is the magic of parallel file systems, i.e. great scalability and performance, without the complexity, because it's all been virtualized and embedded inside a single storage controller pair. There's also, when we're doing experiments with customers, this shape of problem, relatively small compute but large data, is also relevant in certain algorithms. And we're experimenting with uh, certain customers about virtualizing their own applications and placing them inside the storage controller to take advantage of the low latency that those applications see, because they're sitting in the same main memory space as the RAID controller itself. So we get advantage of low, low latency. Have a time check, please. Five? <laughs> okay. The last one, which is the main uh, part of the talk. We're just starting. No, okay, I'll squish it down, I'll squish it down. Um, compute data all over the place, which is, again, a, a really big challenge. A little more, thanks. The compute data all over the place, and this is really the big challenge. Um, it's quite tough um, and very common. So I took this Martin slide, I'm gonna sort of shift away and just go a bit of a sideline about the problems of, of normal ways of data management, um, which we've been talking about so far. Um, so this is our nice marketing slide. I'm gonna ruin it by adding all the actual things that aren't simple about data lifecycle management. Uh, one is you have complex directory trees and files, and files in your platform, which can get very cumbersome at very large scale. Two, of course, with conventional extents-based file systems, which we all run underneath our parallel file systems and under NFS file systems, we always have this, um, these tree, these data structures of inodes, and the inodes allow us, and vnodes, they allow us to, with given a file name, to work out where on earth on the disk it is, with pointers to pointers to pointers to blocks on disk. Complex. Um, as we know, file system checks are not fun. Um, when we have large file systems and we think, oh, let's have a nice bit of downtime and reboot that thing, and then it says, I'm going to do a file system check, uh, this is no fun for any administrators to find that they've got to wait a day for the system to come back. Uh, RAID, RAID, of course, we all think, yeah, we need RAID, that's going to protect our data. Of course, it's actually also a cumbersome thing to manage. And similarly, um, with volume management as well, when we have to create volumes, we have difficulty extending file systems and shrinking them. Uh, when we use conventional file systems, we get fragmentation. So things go slower as they get filled up. Um, the files get spread around. We might have to do defragmentation exercises, or we might just live with the consequences, one or the other. And finally, all these conventional, traditional file systems are based in silos. So if we want to start replicating and moving things around in a sort of a, to create this nice uh, one file system space, we're gonna have to do something pretty complicated to try and manage that. We need to synchronize these multiple file systems around the globe. So that's actually um, a summary of the biggest problems of normal file systems as we seem today. And we, um, we started working on an alternative to this a few years ago, and it's shipped about three years ago, um, and it's called uh, WAS. So it's an object store, and these are quite popular. If you talk to um, vendors, then storage vendors, they'll talk about object stores and cloud. This is a sort of, so cloud storage tends to work on top of object stores. And the, this term object store really just means uh, the files are treated as objects which might also include metadata about the objects, um, policies regarding the objects, and also we usually mean there's an API. We don't usually mount this directly as a file system, a POSIX file system. We talk to an API, like a C API or a RESTful HTTP-like API, 
Python, PHP, or something like this. So we do puts of objects, and then we get objects, and we can delete them. So we're using a software infrastructure to do this. Which is a bit strange, again, for us HPC people. We kind of think, oh, you just mount that, and then you just write your files into it using fwrite, or something like that, using your C application, or you do MPIIO. But of course, in many scenarios, like bioinformatics, um, and in many commercial realms, what they have is some kind of database, like a Postgres database or something like that, where they stick handles to where their data lies, and they stick the actual data on, on, on directory structures. So in bioinformatics, if you're doing complex workflows, you need to know where your data is, and you hold a database which tells you where it is in the file system. Now, in that case, the file system is really obsolete. You don't really need it. It's, it's redundant because you've already got the metadata management in your database. What you need is just um, a put and a get and some kind of handle for that thing. So anyway, the object store was, as I say, developed quite a while ago, three years, shipping for three years. Um, looks like this. this is a box with 60 disks inside. It's actually split in two down the middle, so it's two nodes. You connect it to the internet or the, your, your LAN via InfiniBand or Ethernet, 10 gig or gigabit. But you don't connect one, you connect multiple of them uh, onto the network and they start working in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion and moving objects around between themselves. Inside the system, there's um, no traditional RAID, uh, there's no traditional file system, there's no inode references. That means there's no file system checks for whether inodes haven't got data associated with them. There's no volume management, and it's not based on a single site, single box architecture. So it's um, so you're kind of wondering, well, how does it work? I guess um, how does that work without this all this normal stuff that we're used to? So the bottom half of this picture is the inside of the was core, the box we just saw. So what runs inside that box, and then. On the top there, connectors, that's the methods we use to access a system, which are external. So the core is um, deliberately uh, simple and therefore efficient and scalable. So literally, we, we are proposing that you have um, billions of objects spread around the globe in these systems, and it's a very manageable, scalable system. So we're talking about a scale above a traditional, very high-end parallel file system. And to do that, so I'll give you one example of how we do this. Um, we get rid of the file system. We've got to have some way of having a system to put the files, the objects, on a disk. And what we actually do is we look at the size of incoming objects and we group them into like-size objects and then we place them on disk in a contiguous uh, line. Long story short, uh, this is a very efficient, very quick way of translating an object which comes in through an Ethernet uh, gateway into uh, a position on disk. So the access methods, I'll just summarize those. So, of course, as I said, normally we use an API. So we do puts and gets into this thing, and then we, we let the system replicate the data globally. Um, it can protect the data using something called a RAID coding, which means it's kind of, it is kind of a RAID, but we RAID each object individually and then stripe across multiple disks and then add parity. So we have this data protection. We've got a very simple way of putting things on disks. And these multiple boxes around the globe are always talking to each other, moving objects between each other depending on the policy you've applied to the object. So if you say, I want this object to be replicated three times in China, once in Japan, and three times in the US, you can place it into the WAS system any way you like. Then after a super amount of time, the time it takes for the data to move around, the policy will have been adhered to. And if nodes fail, the policy says, oh well, um, now my objects are no longer in compliance with your policy. So it recreates a new object, so that, so that it is in compliance. So all this self-healing is kind of built into this sort of a simplified uh, file system. But to talk to the real world, we need APIs, that's good. But we've also got NFS and SIFS gateways. So you can put external servers outside the system, and you can export to your normal uh, Linux or Windows clients. And the advantage there is um, that the data that they put in gets magically DR'd archived, distributed around the planet. Putting it really simply, it's in two halves. So the bottom half is this wonderful bucket of distributed objects. You just put stuff in it using your API. And what do you get when you do a put? You get given object ID, a string. 
And if you, you, you've got to keep that string in a database somewhere. So the top half is this object ID management. So you do puts from the top half into the was core. The stuff gets replicated. You get given an object ID. And you manage that object ID in some kind of database. And of course, with the NFS servers and the SIF servers we had in the previous uh, picture, those servers themselves have a database managing the NFS data that goes in and the OIDs. So you can retrieve them when somebody does uh, a read. Alternatively, we can use some kind of cloud platform. So we have actually got um, on my phone over there a little was cloud application for iPhone. So I can open the application just like a Dropbox and I can share my files and upload files into the cloud. And therefore, it, it actually what it does is it talks to one IP address of many of these WAS systems around the planet, puts the object in, it gets policy replicated around the world, and I can retrieve it anywhere else at low latency. Okay, so um, just to pause a little bit there for the last couple of slides. This is our solution for that problem where the data is all over the place, and you want to ask for it at any point in your organization or in a distributed organization. What I haven't addressed yet is how we can combine these sort of mainly two different fields. So one is traditional parallel high-performance POSIX-based file systems and this different world of API-based object storage. Fine, five minutes. I'm going to do it less than five minutes. I'm going to beat that target. So one way we can do this is by using HSM capabilities in existing file systems like GPFS to automatically move uh, backend data blocks into the object store. So in this way, we can maintain metadata in our parallel file systems, but move the blocks into the object store. And once they're in the object store, they get replicated, they get disaster recovery. So if we lose sites, we can still get data. Um, and they get shared to other parties if we want them. And we don't have to do anything about that. We don't have to write some synchronizing file system and manage it every day and work out what's happening. We just place it into WAS, and WAS does the underlying replication. Furthermore, at remote sites, we can see those objects because we have gateways into NFS and SIFs. So this is um, one of our first steps into merging these worlds of traditional parallel file systems into object stores. And um, similarly, I was at a, an IRODS conference, I'm not quite sure, one of the weeks in the past two weeks uh, in Munich, and uh, I gave a talk there about our work with IRODS. And I mentioned IRODS before, it's this sort of middleware that you, you can put on multiple storage devices. They don't necessarily have to be DDN. Uh, they could be any kind of storage device. Um, you can put it on a parallel file system, you can put it on some object stores, you can put it on some NAS system. And you put these server systems around these various storage devices. And then you have some kind of centralized catalog where you hold all the metadata. And when users do queries, they say, oh, okay, give me this file. Actually, of course, somehow we talk to the metadata system. It knows where the replicas are. It tells you where they are. And it automatically sends you back the data from wherever it's actually stored. And also within iRODS, we can do microservices. We can do rules. So like HSM, you can create a rule, a really arbitrary rule. So you know, any files, if you really don't like Bob, so any files which Bob wrote in the last day, just take it off the really fast parallel file system and stick it on the old NAS system. Um, and if you want to do something to it, if you want, let's, let's corrupt that data, move it over there and let's corrupt it. We don't like it. But any kind of arbitrary rule we can create within iRODS and we can um, process this stuff on a global scale. So we've been shipping this so iRODS runs out of the box on a POSIX file system. So we can run it on a parallel file system. So the Sanger Center in the UK, they've got a really good paper where they, these are the human genome people. So a big site, and they're very big users of iRODS. And they've got a huge luster system running on the SFA 10Ks. Um, but they coordinate all their bioinformatics workflows from the gene sequences through to the parallel file systems, getting hammered by BLAST and HMMR runs these bioinformatics applications. They coordinate that workflow using, using iRODS. And um, we've had an iRODS uh, driver for WAS, the object store, for about, um, about a year now. And there's a new uh, enterprise version of iRODS coming out soon, which we were talking about at the conference last week. And we'll have this new driver, a more intelligent driver for this, uh, for this new iRODS e thing. But a long story short, iRODS enables you to in-connect parallel file systems 
analytical systems, Hadoop systems, uh, and cloud storage with this policy-based infrastructure. Uh, so, that's my conclusion. So scaling up and out and deep across the big data landscape requires a range of different sort of building block shapes to address all the different sorts of shaped um, requirements they are in this big sort of big data spectrum of problems. Second one around was managing complexity at a global scale, so distributing data around the globe and managing that stuff at very large scales. So scales 10, 100,000 times what we used to today requires a very different system. We can't use RAID, volume management, standard extent space file systems. We do something different. And we at DDN do was. And finally, and I addressed a bit of this today, there'll be more coming this year, connecting these big data spaces is the next huge challenge for companies like DDN. Thank you. So the consistency problem is quite easy because these objects are immutable. So you don't modify the objects. You can put them or get them or delete them. The performance question, uh, so actually we do extremely good read performance and extremely good write performance. You would expect me to say that, but I'll, I'll explain why. So A, we do good reads because we, we've got rid of the extent-based file system. So at a low level, we can do this really nice single disk seek to get to the first object of the block because of the way we, we very simply place these objects in like size areas on disk. In terms of the RAID thing, what we do is we've got two policies when you place your object in. You can either say, replicate this object multiple times across the globe, or you can say, take this object and smear it across multiple disks and add some parity somewhere. Okay? So there's actually two methods, and you can mix them two up. So you can have two copies, both erasure coded, for example. Um, but in terms of performance, what happens is you have this, let's say, huge number of clients accessing data. Because there's no modify, we don't have this problem of having, you know, this, um, we don't have to manage this sort of, uh, the, the locking mechanisms. We don't have to do that. Um, but we also include latency maps at every point in the system. So wherever you ask for the data, um, it will either proxy for or send you directly to the lowest latency copy of that data by, uh, by, by magic. So if you use the, our API or the NFS or IRODS, they all use this latency map, this intelligent latency map, so they always get pointed directly to the lowest latency copy of that data. So if, for example, you wanted a very high read rates from these systems, um, and there were small files, uh, this would be a perfectly good environment, because with a single disk seek from the local, most local system, we can get straight to that data and, and read it back to you. If you wanted huge streaming rights, we have something else called a WAS caching server. So we work with... Um, a DVR in the sky, a, a video recording company in the sky, so like a clouded video recording system. And what they do is they cache um, these um, video files in caching servers, which then use the object store as the back end for the, this, this permanent repository. So we've got various ways of doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah, complex answer. Any others? Thank you very much. <laughs>